Today, uh, I am going to try to carry my tradition from, from my church um, over into this space. And my aim when I preach God's word is to cause the people of God to rest in the finished work of Christ. So uh, in one sense, uh, these are categories that I want to give you uh, this morning. We won't use them very much, but the, the gospel, I'm sorry, the law, let's say this is the law. The law says do, the gospel says done. Why is the gospel good news? Because it's done, right? Now the law gives us instruction on how to worship God. However, the law only condemns us before God because we are unable to perfectly fulfill the law. So the law tells me any law, any command. It's not just Moses, right? Any command in scripture, love your wife like Christ loved the church. Now, I try to love my wife like Christ loved the church because that's how I worship God rightly, right? So I'm aiming for that. Nevertheless, I don't know that I have ever loved my wife with the fiery intensity that Jesus loves his church, but I'm trying and I'm growing and I'm aiming and I'm pressing because that shows me how to worship God rightly. So in one sense, the law is gonna give us instruction on how to live our lives, but the gospel is going to tell us that it has been accomplished for us. There's no condemnation. That message of law and gospel is married to the gifts of the spirit. Many of us believe that we actually have to do good works to earn justification. And as Protestants, we say, no, (laughs) no, no, no. It's by grace through faith alone. And can I tell you that the gifts of the Spirit at that same token are a gift of God. They're good news. It's a free gift that he's given his people. And you don't have to do to get. It's a message of reception. So uh, I hopefully can, can do that this morning. That's my aim. Can we do something, again, trying to take my tradition into church? Can we do something for me? Can we stand for the reading of the word? Uh, this is something that we do. Uh, back in the day when, when a woman would walk in the room, we would stand to honor her beauty and grace. Uh, when a general would walk into a room, we'd call the room to attention because there's some marching orders given. So we do that with the word of God because uh, it is both beautiful and glorious and simultaneously our marching orders. So uh, let's go to uh, Acts chapter one. That's where we're gonna be. Uh, Acts chapter 1. I know where Acts is in my Bible, if I flip the right way. Um, It goes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Acts, um, if you didn't know. Somebody caught that joke. If you don't know where to find the book of Acts, the person next to you would likely help you. So just kind of nudge the person next to you and ask for help. Uh, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. This is God's word. You may be seated. Uh, How quick was that? That was real easy. I'm not gonna make you stand for the whole sermon. Some of you guys were afraid. I saw that look of fear in your eye. Whoa, the whole thing? No, just the launching verse, guys. So this is an interesting verse. I don't know if you've noticed, Acts, how it starts. It says these are the things in the first book. That's the book of Luke. O Theophilus, this great ruler in Rome. uh, These are the things that Jesus began to do and teach. The implication that Luke is giving in the book of Acts now is that the book of Acts are the things that God is continuing to to do and teach. The things that Jesus began to do and teach in Luke, but he's continuing to do and teach in the book of Acts. So some people have called the the book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit or the Acts of the Church. I would want to call Acts the, the Acts of Jesus. This is Jesus performing work in his church. And when I want you to think of performing works in the church, I want you to be thinking of it in terms of um, not imitation, but representation. So you, those categories might not make perfect sense yet, but I'll, I'll get there. Imitation is where we try to copy and mimic. And representation actually has authority behind it. So when I was a kid, I would jump up in my dad's chair. He had this like, you know, those like kind of corduroy looking chairs that were blue, a recliner, and he would sit in that and the the box fan from the window would be blowing on him. And I would jump up in my dad's lap. And sometimes my mom would come in to like, you know, kind of love on us. And I'd be like, mom, get out of the fan. You're you're, you're breathing our air. Get out of here, mom. You know, like me and dad are being cool. And and dad would work on, he was a mechanic. He'd work on planes. So when, when my dad would get home, you know, he would flex. And I got, to, I got to feel his arm. Now, I was built like sheetrock, you know what I mean? Like I was so skinny, I was a string being, but I would feel my dad's arm. And what's the very first thing that every kid does when they feel their dad's bicep? Anybody? They flex back. The instant, instantaneously, no matter what the kid does, there's something about their dad's strength that makes them feel strong. That's imitation. Now, now growing up, I wasn't a mechanic, so my, my kid didn't get to look forward to like the masculinity of his father. Uh, he was a podcaster who read books for a living, okay? So... <laughs> So, so here's, a, here's a clip of my son imitating me. Do you guys have that back there? And, and we, and this is the way we, 
well. And thank you, or thank you so much for coming. Ezra, Ezra's in his room playing for Daddy. And then, and then, and Raymond asleep, and I'm awake watching this TV show. And and he, and Mommy's asleep too. And me and Daddy are, and Ezra are awake. And then Ezra is awake. And we love you, world. And this is a way we on Jesus. Amen. The Jesus name, amen, at the end was the best part. Thank you, Remnant Radio, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, see, my kid, uh, he's been into my studio, and at the time, this was seven years ago, so he's 10 now, right? So he's like, <laughs> if he knew I shared this video, I'd, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be safe to sleep at night, okay? So my, my son, uh, he, he would go into the studio room, and we had, at the time, because Remnant was getting off the ground, I couldn't afford tripods, so I had an iPhone on a selfie stick covered in duct tape, and it had so much duct tape on it that I could slide it into the hand of a microphone stand from church. And that's, that's how I got all my cameras set up. So when he sees dad's phone, he thinks it's remnant radio. So he found the record button, and he is, he is being me, right? That's what we call imitation. It has no authority. You know, David today, being 10, trying to imitate me, he could come in, he could, my, my co-host, Michael Roundtree, he could come up to Michael and say, Michael, Thank you so much for your time and service that you've given to Remnant. We thank you uh, for all of your many hours and, and years of service. Uh, however, we're going in a different direction. You're fired, right? Roundtree would just laugh at him. Like, you have no authority. You have no power here. But nevertheless, one day, let's say uh, I get much older. David gets much older. Maybe I get sick. And I send David as my proxy to represent me in the board. Well, now David actually has authority. He's not imitating me. He is representing me. And those are very different terms. And I feel like so often when we think about the gifts of the spirit, what we think of, I'm going to imitate, I'm going to try, I'm going to hope, and just maybe I will imitate Jesus and then the gifts of the spirit will happen. And I think that's a wrong view. I think you're actually supposed to represent Jesus on the earth. You are his hands and feet. No. Rep imitation isn't bad, right? The WWJD bracelet, that's good. Thinking about how Jesus would respond in a given situation, how he would care for the widow and the orphan, that's a good thing. You should imitate Jesus. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. In fact, scripture goes out of its way to say so. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. 1 Peter 2, 21, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example the Christian is called to more than mere imitation, however. We're called to represent. And, and again, that word, representation, is two words. Re-present. Present again the life and the ministry of Jesus. It actually comes with authority. It comes with power. The power of representation comes extranos. That's a big Latin phrase that means outside of us. In the same way that we look for righteousness outside of us, because our righteousness is not enough, we actually have to look for power outside of us in order to represent the life of Jesus. I don't know about any of you, but I have not lived with the kind of power that Jesus lives on the earth. And yet there are promises that greater signs and wonders will follow. So my faith, I, I hope, and I hope, I hope you hear me, my faith cannot be rooted in my imitation because the day that I don't pray as much as I did the day before, the week that I, did, I wasn't fasting and someone comes to me and they're demonized, am I going to not have faith in my faith? Oh, you know, I haven't really been working very hard this week. I haven't, I have not really prayed up. You know, oh, you know, I, you know, I, w I had an outburst of anger last week with my son and, and I don't know if I'm ready to do this deliverance thing right now. Or is my faith pent up not in my good works, but in what Christ has done for us? Knowing that the life he gave, when he dies on the cross, he gives up his spirit to the Father. Why? So that we would have the spirit of Christ dwelling in us. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you bodily. You are the temple of God. You are not spiritual sheetrock. Right? You, you, if you walk around thinking you'll have an imposter syndrome, what was a word that we heard this morning, an imposter syndrome where, where you think, oh, if people just knew how I lived, they wouldn't believe that God could come and use through me. I, Martin Luther has a great phrase. When I look at my life, I don't know how I could be saved. But when I look at his, I don't know how I could be damned. 
And in the same token, I want you to think, well, when I look at my life, there is no way I can believe for a moment that God would use me to prophesy, to speak in tongues, to heal the sick, to cast out devils, right? Those are the big ones. We like talking about the Pentecostal church, cast out devils, right? Those are the big ones. And I can't imagine God using me for those things. When you look at your life, that's, that is going to be the case. But if you keep your eyes fixed on him, there's no way that you can imagine he wouldn't. Because that is how good the gospel is. The gospel is so good that he doesn't just, it's not a great mission. Hey guys, good luck, I'm out. He didn't spin the world into the universe, you know, in, in the universe into existence and then just kind of walk away after the, the resurrection. It's not a great mission, it's a great co-mission. It's a co-operation. It's him holding your hand and doing the work with you. Man, I've got so many stories I could tell. Anyway, I'm gonna stick to the notes because I got a shot clock, so let's keep going, okay. Um, there's such a substantive difference. This is the way that I want you to think. Um, you'll always have bad days where you try to imitate, imitate Jesus. There will be days where you won't be able to follow through to the same ability, but I want you to have faith again in what Jesus has done and not what you have done. In the same way, imitation is a process, representation is an objective reality. In the same way that we have sanctification and justification, right? Sanctification is where my life is being transformed to look more and more like Jesus. Justification is an objective reality that says this is who you are in God's sight. It's forensic, it's finished, it's accomplished. Imitation, you and I are gonna continue to do that and we're gonna ebb and flow. That's gonna be like sanctification. But representation, I mean, think about the apostles. You have Peter who 40 days prior denied the Messiah to a little girl over a fire. And days later, what's he doing? He's bucket a bow showing and preaching the gospel. Not because he's good, but because Christ is good. It seems as if 10, 20 days later, maybe a month later, you know, they're, they're at a gate, and we'll read that verse right here. In Acts chapter 3, verse 12, there's a, a man at the gate Silver and gold I do not have, but this one thing I have, rise and walk in the name of Jesus. The, the crippled man is asking Peter and John for something, and they say, we don't have anything, but we can make you whole. So he stands up to his feet, completely healed. And then the people of Israel begin to look at Peter and John in Acts chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or our own piety we have made him walk? Do you hear that? as if it was by our own power or holiness we have made him walk, some translations will say. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses and his name by faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all. I hope that can be a kind of pressure release valve for you. He, he, one of the, the earliest miracles in the book of Acts, he said, it wasn't our holiness that did this. Hopefully that kind of releases pressure because if we're honest with ourselves, there's something habitual in our life that we're wrestling with. Maybe it's pride, maybe it's anger, right? Maybe, maybe it's selfish ambition, maybe we're greedy, maybe there's something in our life. And if, we, if we're honest with our sin, and then there's a moment where we have an opportunity to put Jesus on display, hopefully it's not those things that are coming flooding to our mind as if they will rob us of confidence in what Jesus has done for us. So the enemy would want. Today, I'm going to hopefully make the case that Jesus is king, he is prophet, and he is priest. He is prophet, he is priest, he is king. These are the, the ministries of Jesus. His ministry began in the book of Luke, what he began to do and teach. But the book of Acts is what he is continuing to do and teach. So I hope that today I will be able to articulate the ministry of Jesus as it is related to his kingly office is carried out through the church. His ministry as a priest is still carried out through the church. His ministry of a prophet is still being carried out through the church. And we're going to look to the scriptures, not a personal experience, but we're going to look to the Bible and how the ministry of Jesus as a king 
pushed out darkness and conquered dark territory, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. As a priest, we're going to see uh, how, how Jesus makes unclean things clean through the work of healing. We're also going to see how Jesus uses the gift of prophecy and his administration of his prophetic office. And then we're going to see that all of us are then seated in Christ in the heavenly places and how that is a direct connection to our access to these free gifts. Let's start with Jesus as a king. And I am tempted to go back into the Old Testament and look to all the verses that prophesy of a coming king, but we won't. We'll, we'll, we'll just focus on these verses. Uh, for the Christian, there's no question that Jesus is king. Wise men came to celebrate his kingly reign in Matthew 2. 2. Gabriel uh, t- tells Mary uh, that, we, uh, that, that he, uh, da- uh, Jesus, will sit on the throne of David forever in Luke 1, 32. Nathan calls him the king of Israel in John, uh, uh, for, uh, John chapter 1, verse 49. The, the high priest asks him uh, at the crucifixion, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus says, it is as you have said. Additionally, the apostolic writers uh, ascribe to Jesus king of heaven and earth. Paul calls him king of kings and lord of lords in 1 Timothy 6.15. Matthew tells uh, his audience at the Great Commission that all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And the very next words out of his mouth are, go therefore. All authority in heaven and earth. You are the king of heaven and earth if you have all authority in heaven and on earth. The book of Revelation, John frequently depicts Jesus as king over all. If you didn't know, the ministry of a king was to rule justly, to defeat God's enemies, to promote obedience to the law, and to bless the nations. The purpose of Israel and the king's ministry was, in fact, to bless the nations. So half of the ministry of the king was in the doing, and half of the ministry of the king was in the teaching. And if you didn't catch that, You look very carefully at this outline. You see that uh, Jesus ruled. How are you to, uh, Jesus ruled, a king was to rule. How was a king to rule? A king was to rule uh, in that he was to uh, read the the, the law and to write out the law of God and present it to a Levitical priest before he could become king. And And the Levitical priest would review the written testament of that king and know, ah, the king now knows the law of God. The king can rule justly in light of the word of God. Half of it was in the teaching. And blessing the nation of Israel, or blessing the nations being the light of God in the earth as the nation of Israel. And then part of it was in the doing and and administering justice and pushing out the kingdom of darkness. Jesus was a perfect king in both the doing and in the teaching. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at near. In the same chapter, down a few verses to verse 23, Jesus went through all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and sickness among the people. And Matthew 12, 28, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You see, Jesus upheld the teaching portion of the kingly ministry because people would come to him asking, well, what, what would happen if this man uh, married this woman and this woman married her brother and she married all these seven? How would you administrate this rule and this justice and this reign? And Jesus, according to the law of God, administers justice. And when there are demons inside uh, the synagogue, he casts out the demons and he heals the sick. He brings the kingdom of heaven to earth. But I think the question is, has Jesus hung up his heavenly crown? Is Jesus still the king of heaven? Is he still administering his kingly reign? Is he still proclaiming the good news, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Is he still pushing out the kingdom of darkness now that he's sitting on his throne? And the answer is no. He's actually doing it through you. You know, the book of Isaiah in chapter 59, I won't read it because it'll take us too much time, but in Isaiah chapter 59, there's an account of the people of Israel who've kind of gone wayward, and there's a remnant looking for justice, but there's none to be found. They grope along the walls like the blind, and they can't, they can't find justice. They're seeking for righteousness, and they can't find it. And it says that Yahweh looks down, and Yahweh sees that there was no justice, and it displeased him. There was no one to stand in the gap to, like, produce this kingdom of righteousness. And then it says, then he himself came down. His own right arm brought salvation. He put on a helmet of salvation. He put on a breastplate of righteousness, and he clothed himself with garments of vengeance. What does it sound like to you? Sounds like Ephesians chapter 6, right? The armor of God. 
It was the first time when I read Isaiah that I realized this is not the armor from God, it's the armor of God. What a significant change that when we get to the battlefield, it is not as though, uh, uh, you know, hey, uh, look at Josh in his own righteousness. No, it's Josh in the king's righteousness. Do you see that sword? That's the very sword that Jesus bore when he was on the earth. Do you see the salvation that is mounted upon his head? That's the same, that's the same salvation that Jesus came with. He says the articles are articles of vengeance. Think about that. The gospel shoes of peace are vengeance. Like when the enemy sees us walking with peace, he's like, oh man, I'm trembling in my boots. And I would hope that the people of God would recognize that they are sealed with the power of God. Not in your power. Don't trust your own ability. Trust in the, that's what the, 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 the armor of God says at the end of Ephesians 6. Stand for, therefore, therefore stand strong in the power of his might. In the strength of his strength, stand. Not in your ability, in his and when you're on the earth, man, you represent Jesus. I love the story of the sons of Sceva. It's a fun story because it was bad deliverance ministry and the church still grew from it. It was wild. The fear of the Lord gripped them all and the church grew, right? These guys come in, the sons of a Jewish sorcerer, and they're like, hey, I'm a Jewish sorcerer. That's what I'm going to call him. He's a Second Temple Jewish kind of mystic dude. Anyway, so uh, uh, the sons of Sceva come in and they're like, hey, we command you to leave in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the demon responds, Jesus we gnosko, we know him. Paul, we episcomai, we've heard about that guy. But who the heck are you? You've got no armor. You've got no authority. You don't represent this guy. Who are you? You can't throw around the name of Jesus as if it were a spell to bend demons into authority. You either can, as a police officer, say, stop in the name of the law and appeal to a greater authority outside of yourself that you're you are rightly ordained and issued from, right? Or you're representing your own authority, in which case you get beaten naked and thrown out of a, of a situation. If you haven't read that story, the Bible's wild, okay? Uh, <laughs> dude, I've never, ever, I mean, I'll tell you what, if you start telling people if you do deliverance ministry, you might end up naked running through the street. I think we'd have less people signing up for it, I'll tell you what. Um, what does it mean that you're seated in heavenly places in Ephesians 2, 6? What does it mean in Matthew 28 when Jesus said, you have all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, go therefore. What does it mean in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, when he says, you are a holy race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellency of him who called you. It's because you are a representative. You are little kings and queens in the earth bringing the kingdom of God. And this is why this is important. It's because if you're going to be a Christian, you are going to be put into situations that you don't know what to do. And if you have expectation, again, in your righteousness, you're going to fall short. I remember there was a woman who came to us in church, and she would, she would have vertigo. And she had it, um, I mean, for a whole six months. She seemed to get healed. And then every time, um, uh, well, there would be shifts in, in ministry. And whatever happened, this vertigo would keep coming back. And, and we talked to her a couple of times, trying to figure out what this was going on. I mean, we prayed for her for months. And uh, anyway, and, and to be clear, uh, you can have a sickness and it not be anything but just the natural world. Like, I don't mean to say that sicknesses are demonic, but because this thing was leaving and coming back, it seemed odd. And there were also seeming triggers that I necessarily don't want to get into. But uh, we talked to this lady and we just said, hey, ma'am, we're going to pray. I want you to close your eyes and ask Jesus to show you the picture of why this thing keeps coming back. And she goes, okay. She closed her eyes. I don't think it was 60 seconds. It couldn't have been two minutes. She prays. She goes, whoa, I, I just got this really weird picture, but it's not possible. And I said, well, tell us what it is. And she goes, I have a picture of when I was a small child um, before I was adopted. I was probably four. And she said, uh, I was being dedicated at a Mormon temple. I had a white garb on and I was being baptized. And I go, okay, that'll do it. Um, and I said, uh, I said, cool. You want to look into my eyes, hold my hands? And I, I just said, you know, uh, I won't tell you exactly what I said. But I commanded the spirit to leave her in Jesus' name. And then the next thing she did was very unexpected. Okay. Uh, her hands were like pinned to her side, right? And she was doing this with her face. And then she started trying to swing at me like this. Like, I don't know if you've ever like prayed for someone and they start like T-Rex swinging at you from the side like this. Like it's an, it's an obnoxious thing. But I didn't know what to do with that. I've never cast out a, a demon that was, cur this woman was cursed because of some kind of Mormon ritual. I didn't know, I didn't know how to deal with that situation. I didn't know what to do when someone was swinging at me and start like, you know, their face was moving all over the place. I had no clue what to do. But can I tell you, I knew someone 
who had the power over life and death. I have someone who at the power of his name, all demons have to submit and flee and run. And, and, and even though I didn't know what to do in this situation, my confidence wasn't in even my reasoning or my rationality or how to handle it, but my faith and confidence was in the man who, who came to set the, liber- the captives free, to sit at liberty uh, those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I, I came into this situation never having done anything with deliverance ministry with Mormons in my life, never having seen this manifestation. And if you're going to proclaim the gospel, if you're going to tell people to repent and believe, you're going to come upon people who are going to say things like, yeah, but I was assaulted as a child. They're going to say things that you're not going to expect, like, oh yeah, my dad was a pastor and he cheated on my mom. And, and you're going to hear things like, oh, the church hurt me because when, when I started wrestling through my sexuality, you know what happened? They blacklisted me and kicked me out of the church. You're going to wrestle with hard situations and what you need to do is have faith that the same Jesus who set you free can set them free. The same Jesus that has the power over the demonic in the New Testament is still in you today. So, so if you are going to be on the earth doing the ministry of Jesus, whether it's through the, the doing, like telling demons to leave, or the preaching, either one of them, your faith better rest in him and not in you. Next, we see that Jesus is a priest. The ministry of uh, of the priesthood is done through intercession, offering up saf- sacrifices, uh, purification, making unclean things clean, and teaching the law. We see Jesus doing this throughout his ministry, making intercession uh, in Hebrews 7:25, offering up sacrifices, Hebrews 10:12, purification for sins, Hebrews 9:14, and teaching the law. We've already we've already gone into this, but we see that Jesus, even on the mount, when he's doing the sermon on the mount, he teaches through the law, and you can very quickly miss what is being said. You could, you could be reading, oh, Jesus is coming with this brand new teaching that no one's ever heard before, but that is not what he's doing in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying, you have heard it said this, but I'm telling you this. You've read the Bible like this, but this is what the Bible's always meant. At the end of the Sermon of the Mount, we know this because they say he does not teach as the scribes, those who copy the law. He teaches as one with authority, authorship, someone who wrote the law. So when he gets done preaching, they're like, dude, this priest is different. I don't know if you know this, but a priest, according to Numbers chapter 4, a priest was to be mikvahed before his ministry. At the age of 30, when a priest was going to begin his priestly ministry, he would be brought to a body of water and washed. It's called a mikvah. We, we, We have a similar word for baptism. So Jesus, at the age of 30, before he begins his ministry, goes and gets mikvahed by who? John the Baptist, the son of a Levitical priest. So Levi is now baptizing Melchizedek, not because he needs to be in the tribe of Levi, because Jesus was born into the tribe of Judah. Jesus is a priest, according to Hebrews, from a different line, unto the order of Melchizedek, a forever eternal priesthood outside of Judah. So Jesus comes on the scene, he gets washed and cleansed, And he's beginning his priestly ministry. And the ministry of the priest, if you don't know, is to make unclean things clean and to proclaim the teaching of God's word in order to keep people clean. So Jesus, in John chapter 15, verse 3, you are already clean because of the words that I have spoken to you, the word katheiros, he means you've already been pruned off. I've washed you through the the teaching of the word of God, as we see in the book of Ephesians. So, So Jesus comes and he's proclaiming the word of God, washing people and making them clean, but he also performs miracles, making unclean people clean. There's a woman with the issue of blood in Matthew chapter 9, 20 through 22. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. So here, this woman would have been ceremonially unclean. She would not have been allowed to touch Jesus. And the ministry of Jesus is so much better than Levi because when Levi would touch something that is unclean, he would become unclean. The priesthood, by touching something unclean, would themselves become unclean. But the ministry of Jesus has such a cleanliness and such a purity and such a holiness that when the unclean people would merely touch Jesus, the unclean people would be made clean. We see this uh, also with the leper in Mark chapter 1, 40 through 42. And a leper came to him imploring, and kneeling said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Catch this. Moved with pity. Your your translation might say compassion. It means to feel what other people feel. So moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him. 
He touched him before he said anything. This man might have not been touched in like 20 years. I mean, think about it. He was in a leper camp all to himself. He had to, before a person in Israel could even get near him, he had to yell, unclean, unclean, as in order not to contaminate the rest of the people. I mean, if this man had a, an issue, I don't know what, you, what it's like. I don't know if you know what it's like to have a, a disability that you carry. It's heavy. Day in and day out, here this leper would have been considered a second-class citizen. And if you are carrying something, you are in the image of God, whether you are healed or not, and you are, and this is what we see from Jesus, you are, you're beautiful and holy and meaningful, and he loves you, and the people of God should love you. Whether you're healed or not, you're not a notch in our belt theologically. Hey, look, we healed a person, woohoo. No, Jesus was moved to compassion because of the, the weight of this illness. And he stretched out and touched him first, and then declares him to be healed. Immediately, the leper left him, and he was made clean. But the question is, is Jesus still a priest? Has he, has he taken off the, the priestly turban? Has he taken off the ephod and hung it in the court of heaven? Or is Jesus still a priest today, still doing and teaching, still proclaiming as an author what the word of God has always meant and, all, and still making unclean people clean? And the answer is, yes, he is, and he's doing it through you, the body of Christ. Finally, let's look at Jesus, the prophet. Finally, Jesus is the prophet and the ministry of a, Paul, a prophet is to call people back to covenantal faithfulness and receiving revelation from God for his people to encourage, console, to build up, strengthen. I don't know if you're seeing a pattern yet, but the ministry of G, a prophet, priest, and king is all doing and teaching. Every part of the ministry is doing and teaching. There would be nothing more heartbreaking. I, let me go back to it. There'd be there'd nothing more heartbreaking than if you were to pray for a person and see them get healed and not proclaim the gospel to them. For someone to gain back their health and lose their soul, like that is a slam dunk moment, guys. You've got to preach the gospel. Um, speaking of the ministry of Jesus, like is he still healing? A quick story, because I realize I didn't tell the story and it's, it's one that'll make me cry. So hopefully it'll, you know, it, it's good. It's a good one. Um, I'm at a conference in Houston. Uh, this is 2020, 20, the end of 2020, I think. And uh, everyone's wearing masks still. And this woman comes up to, with me with a shield. She has the, the band around her head because she has, a, she has a disease. And her name is Rose. And Rose asked me if I would pray for her allergy to pain medication because she's always in pain and she has to take pain medication, but she can't because she has an allergy to the pain medication. I said, why do you need the pain medication? She said, it's a long story. And I was like, tell me. So she tells me that she has this thing called, and I'm gonna butcher it if you're a doctor, give me grace. I have a very specific set of skills and it's not this, okay? Transgeminal neuralgia, okay? Trigeminal neuralgia maybe. And it's when, they call it the suicide disease. And it's when the hot and cold sensors fire in your face at the same time. So this woman has been in excruciating pain for 14 years and she can't touch her face. So she, like if her hair falls and touches her face, she is, she is thrown to the floor in pain, right? And, um, and they call it the suicide disease because people can't take it. And um, so, Rose has us pray for her, and we lay hands on her, and, and I won't lie to you, I felt kind of ghosty, right? Like, I felt the power, you know, my buddy feels the power, but I tell you, I don't have any faith, you know, so I'm praying for her, and then I'm like, hey, look, uh, you know, what, what a good, you know, healing evangelist would say is, you know, touch your face and see if it, you know, but I didn't, I didn't want to do this to her, like this precious woman, like I didn't, I didn't have enough faith to ask her to do that, like I didn't want to put her in pain, but without telling her, she'd taken this mask off, and I watched her rub her cheek, and then I watched her husband kiss her for the first time in 14 years on the cheek. And I'll tell you, <laughs> when you see that, you're, you're wrecked forever. Because I came to that moment not believing that God could do it. And he still did it in spite of me because that's how good he is. He still moved to compassion. And, and I hope, man, that we as a people of God can carry the heart of God to see the mission of God accomplished in the earth and to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to these people Jesus is a prophet. Let's get, I, I know I told you that. We would do that. The doing and the teaching. So Jesus certainly, again, we've, we've gone out of our way to explain how the ministry of a prophet is to call people into repentance and Jesus would go around preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, calling people to come back to the faithfulness to the covenant that they are called to. But Jesus did so much more in the ministry of a prophet. He called people uh, he foretold the future, not only called them to repentance, but foretold the future. And in Revelation, 
uh, well, not in Revelation, in, in John 1, 47 through 48, he tells Nathan that he saw him under the fig tree. In John chapter 4, 16 through 19, he had knowledge specifically about this woman at the well. In Matthew 24, 1 through 2, there was a prophecy of the destruction of the temple. Uh, Peter, uh, his denial is prophesied in Matthew 26, 34, and Matthew 26, 69 through 75. The betrayal of Judas is prophesied in John 13 and Matthew 26. His death and resurrection is foretold in Matthew 16, 21, Mark 8, 31, and Luke 9, 22. The coming of the Holy Spirit was predicted in John 14 and John 16. So here is Jesus, and he is a prophet like Moses. He is a prophet who has come to bring a new and better covenant. He is a prophet who demonstrates that he has knowledge of things that he ought not to have knowledge of. But nevertheless, we have to ask the question, is he still prophesying and speaking today? Again, another story, and I'll wrap up. There was a, a woman named uh, Brooke, and Brooke's at her church, and she's a Presbyterian mama, so she comes to all of our services on the gifts of the Spirit because she's got 10 children, and she needs all of them, all the gifts, right? Um, I have three, and I need more than are listed, right? So, uh, Brooke has, has really been interested in this and she's really pursued it and asked God and we had a guy come in and teach kind of like what I'm doing today and, and a little bit of what I'm going to do tonight a lot more of what I'm doing tonight actually and he's teaching on the gift of prophecy and words of knowledge and these kinds of things and he just showed, talked about the different ways that God speaks he speaks through pictures and words and those kinds of things and sometimes God will give us a picture and we, we need to ask God what it means and we kind of interpret this with God and pray through it all together and uh, uh, Brooke says okay yeah I'm down so hey, let's pray and ask God for a picture. And she gets a picture, and you can see the faith just, like, suck out of Brooke. Her, her shoulders are up. She's, like, kind of excited. And then, like, this is dumb. And then my buddy Matthew goes, hey, Brooke, you know, uh, what, what picture do you have? And she's like, well, I got a picture of an ice cream cone with a cherry on top and sprinkles. God, that's not God. That's dumb. And I was like, oh, Lord, like, would you give me a really stupid picture for Brooke? Like a, a wild one, a silly one. That, that would, is ridiculous so I can show her how this works. And I felt like the Lord gave me a picture very quickly. You know, I find that the Lord is really okay with me looking silly, you know? Like uh, dignity is not a fruit of the spirit, I found out. And he really is, would you, would you ask God to like, hey, would you make me look silly for your glory? He's like, sure. Uh, so, uh, so I pray, and Lord, would you give me this picture for Brooke? And, and, and Brooke comes up and says, hey, Brooke, this is what I think has been going on. I think you have been staying up super late at night. You've been praying. Nobody knows you're praying, but God says he sees your prayers and your prayers are real. They're ministering to him. And her eyes got big like saucers. She goes, how did you know? I've been waking up at like 3 a.m. every morning and praying for, for these people in, uh, in our home and our lives. I've been how, how did God show you that? And I said, well, I got a picture of a blue ninja. And her shoulders dropped and she's like, that is so dumb. That's not how this works. And I go, Brooke, that's exactly how this works. I got a picture and I said, Lord, what does this mean? I really saw that blue kind of pop out to me and I went, oh, the, the, the priest in the temple had, had, had wore blue and that's how they ministered to the Lord. So she's, she's ministering before the Lord. Uh, a ninja's a night stalker. Okay, so I'm like, I'm processing with this Lord. Oh, so at night she's ministering to the Lord. She's in prayer. She's like travailing in prayer and ministry and intercession before the Lord. Great, got it, cool. Went to Brooke, hey, I think this is going on. And she's like, that's not how this works. And it's exactly how this works, Right? The, the, the ministry of Jesus with Rose, the ministry of Jesus with that young lady who had been you know, demonized by whatever happened with this kind of Mormon dedication ceremony, this, this woman here who is experiencing prophetic ministry, I didn't know that God was going to heal Rose. I didn't know that God was going to deliver that woman, and I didn't know if God would speak to me. I didn't know if that prophetic word was a prophetic word until I shared it, and I had to weigh it and test it. I don't know these things, but I do know the one who's the source of these things. And I think so many Christians are waiting to be mobilized. They're waiting to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. They're waiting to demonstrate because they think there needs to be a supernatural moment with a scroll and an angel and an open heaven. They're waiting to fall on the floor and shake or something like weird. I don't know, charismatics do weird things. You know, so they're waiting for something like tremendous and then they'll, they'll know, ah, now's the time for me to go into the earth and proclaim the gospel. And I'll tell you, you know what? Something has already happened to you that is so grand and is so mighty and is so majestic and powerful and impossible. It's a miracle. It's called the cross. The cross happened to you. 
I don't know if you know this, but you died 2,000 years ago and you were raised from the dead 2,000 years ago. When were you saved? 2,000 years ago when you were made alive. That encounter that you're looking for to be sent out into the earth has already happened. Jesus, you've been invited into a new and better covenant. You're sealed with the power of the spirit. You are his hands and feet in the earth. You're not a skin tag. You're the body, the hands and the feet of Jesus in the earth. That's for pastor. In conclusion, Acts chapter one, one through two, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So these are all the things that Jesus began to do and teach, but he's still doing and teaching. How? Final verse here, Ephesians 4, 7 through 13. Grace was given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, when it says he ascended and led a host of captive, he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean? That he also who descended into the lower regions of the earth is he who uh, ascended on high, uh, he who descended in the, was the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Sorry, I memorized NASB and reading ESV is hard. Uh, and he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So I don't know if you saw that, but the giving of the spiritual gifts is directly connected to his descending into the lower regions and his ascending and sitting on a throne. So there's a connection between Jesus sitting on the throne and the spiritual gifts that we have access to. It's a free gift of God. You see, by being seated in heavenly places, Jesus is able to minister through the church. When Mary comes to Jesus, do you remember when she's like, hey, she's clinging to him in the garden after his resurrection? He's like, hey, Mary, don't cling to me. It's actually better that I go because when I leave, I can be closer than I've ever been before to all of you. And there's something about the resurrection and the ascension of Christ that roots us into this spiritual reality. Let's pray. Father.